Good afternoon, everyone. I think most of it, most of our crowd today is from the IADP, but in case we have some other folks joining us, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Amina Vavar Kukar, and I'm the director of the International Educational Development Program at Penn GSC. And today it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Francine Menashe to you all. Dr. Menashe is an associate professor in the Department of Leadership, Higher and Adult Education at the University of Toronto's Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, better known, known as OISE, where she teaches in the Educational Leadership and Policy Program and the Specialization in Comparative International and um, Development Education. Her research explores global education governance and policy, aid to education, education for refugees and emergencies, and education partnerships. Through her studies, she seeks to expose and understand power hierarchies, in, particularly, in particular those rooted in colonial legacies within global governance structures and, pol and policymaking processes. Her award-winning research has been funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, Dubai Cares, the National Academy of Education, and the Spencer Foundation, among others. In 2018, she received the George Baraday Award from the Comparative and International Education Society for her article, The Limits of Multi-Stakeholder Governance, The Case of the, of the Global Partnership for Education and Private Schooling. Dr. Menashe also received a half million dollar grant from the Foundation Dubai Cares to support the project Promising Partners Models for Education Emergencies, a global local analysis. She has served as an educational policy advisor to global civil society organizations, UN agencies and international financial institutions, and prior to her academic career, she worked for an NGO in Laos and as a teacher in the Toronto District School um, for, in the Toronto School District. She is co-editor of the journal Comparative Education Review and the author of International Aid to Education, Power Dynamics in an Era of Partnership. Her work is absolutely brilliant and she is one of the leading researchers who is pushing our field to think about racial power hierarchies in global education governance. On a more personal note, before you all joined, I was trying to figure out with Francine when and how we met, and we can't quite identify the time and, and, and moment, but we've known each other for a while, and she's one of the best people I know. So I'm just really delighted to be able to welcome you, Francine, to the International Educational Development Program. And with that, um, you have the floor for about 30, 35 minutes, and then we'll open up to Q&A if that works for you. All right. Well, thank you. That's thank you for that introduction, Amina. Um, I'm I'm so delighted to be here. Um, I'm sharing my screen now. I hope everyone can see. Right. Um, and thank you all so much for joining me today. Um, I sorry. I'm just fiddling around with the video. Okay. Um, I'm very excited to be sharing with you some of my research. I'm going to be focusing my talk today on highlights from a recent study uh, that I conducted with my colleagues on partnerships in education in emergencies. Now, before launching in, I want to acknowledge the support of Dubai Cares. I'm going to um, reference this, uh, this grant in the introduction. They funded this research that I'm going to present to you. Um, I also want to acknowledge my co-PI, Dr. Azina Zakaria, who I introduced, Amina and I, um, and also our co-investigator, Maha Shweb, as well as our whole research team. There was a lot of us, it was a really big project and everyone played a huge part in the research. I'd like to start the talk with a little bit of context. Um, so over the last decade, humanitarian organizations have increasingly advocated for partnerships to address the challenges of educational access and provision in contexts of conflict, disaster and, and other emergencies. So an array of global policy actors have embraced interagency collaboration in education policy making, funding, implementation. So this impetus to partner comes from broader efforts uh, to enhance coordination between agencies, to um, increase effectiveness of programming, efficiency in funding mechanisms, and what's described as a localization agenda in which affected communities are meant to 
engage in all aspects of education policy and implementation. So through this expansion of partnerships, the education and emergency sector has come to resemble a wide policy network of actors and organizations working together across global, national, and local scales. So the, this project sought to understand the nature and impact of such partnerships between organizations uh, in education and emergencies, or EIE, using the educational response to the Syrian refugee crisis in Lebanon as a case study. So we investigated the characteristics of these partnerships, including their activities, their relationships, the different kinds of organizations involved, and how they changed over time. We analyzed specifically the experience of partners within Lebanon, and we examined the effects of partnership activities um, on the education of refugee students. So since 2011, the war in Syria uh, has prompted the mass displacement of nearly 7 million people, largely to neighboring countries. Lebanon alone has attempted to absorb over a half million school-aged children, uh, school-aged refugee children, comprising one-third of all children in Lebanon and 45% of public school enrollments. So this refugee crisis was the focus of our study when we started it, but it just represents one emergency that the country faced over the course of our research. So in October of 2019, protests broke out throughout the country over new taxes and a lack of government accountability. This led to school closures for weeks at a time. Over the next two years, Lebanon saw a severe political and financial crisis with a devastating deterioration of its economy. The COVID-19 pandemic compounded Lebanon's ongoing crises. Many children had already been out of school in late 2019 because of the protests and the outbreak of COVID in March of 2020 resulted in countrywide school closures as with most of the world. And these school closures and a shift to virtual learning had a significant impact on refugee students in particular. Then on August 4th of 2020, a blast described as one of the largest non-nuclear explosions in history detonated in Beirut port, killing hundreds. The explosion devastated a six mile radius of Beirut, damaging over 300 school buildings. And then globally, the study also coincided with the Black Lives Matter protests and a global reckoning on racism. Now, many of the international organizations working within Lebanon began to reflect on racism within their organizations and then in global education more widely. So over a three-year period, we attempted as best we could to capture how this multi-crisis environment impacted education partners and operations over time. We designed the research as an iterative vertical case study where our qualitative analysis um, of global and country level activities were bridged together by a quantitative network analysis. So this allowed us to situate local experience within global phenomenon including global policies and mandates and processes. So we analyze global level data from international organizations, global education policy actors, and country level data within Lebanon, including from locally situated organizations and actors. But we analyzed all these data in reference to each other and over time. So as you can see, our data included over 100 interviews with both global and local actors involved in EIE partnerships, uh, 250 organizational documents, a social network analysis of 440 different organizations working within Lebanon on Syrian refugee education at two separate time points. So we did the network analysis once in 2019 and then again in 2021. 
and three in-depth case studies drawn from an examination of 16 partnerships within Lebanon, which included over 30 site visits and observations. So this, is, uh, this table is all about the case studies that we conducted. Each partnership case study included at least one organization headquartered in the Global North and one headquartered in Lebanon. In each case, at least one was a non-state actor. And we observed their education activities and interviewed stakeholders, both in person and then virtually across a three-year span. So our vertical analysis of all our data revealed several overarching thematic findings, which I'm, I'm going to present to you. I've synthesized them into three for the sake of this presentation. So first, our vertical analysis exposed an environmental shift in education and emergencies that reflects increased marketization of the humanitarian response in education and more generally. So this shift is evidenced in two general ways. First of all, through increased private sector participation in EIE partnerships, where companies in particular have become more engaged. And second, through a more business-like uh, approach to EIE in terms of a competitive, outcomes-based, and data-driven environment that focuses on outputs. So global level evidence points to a rise in private sector participation in education and emergencies. Organizational documents frequently point to a need for increased engagement with the private sector as a non-traditional funding source and to spur new innovation in EIE. So just for example, UNICEF states, it will keep working to strengthen public and private sector partnerships for enhanced results. Interviews with uh, global actors corroborated this rhetoric. Respondents overwhelmingly agreed that the roles of private actors have expanded in EIE and they've become key partners, stating what's new is the engagement of the private sector. And the role of the private sector has absolutely increased in the last few years. Furthermore, the pandemic may have accelerated private actor engagement. Uh, for instance, global actors described how some partnerships uh, with private actors were established specifically to respond to the COVID emergency in education, in particular to rapidly spearhead all the ed tech innovations that could enable learning during mass school closures. A donor respondent explained COVID accelerated that step forward into commitment, particularly the private sector partners couldn't sit by the sidelines, saw an opportunity to really jump in. Another said, I think that we've seen the private sector stepped up in, in distance learning. I think COVID forced the hand on that. So our database and our network analysis lends further evidence to this rise in private participation in education and emergencies, where in a single country, over 100 businesses and corporate foundations of a total of 440 in our database have participated in Syrian refugee education over the course of three years. And it increased by 20% after the onset of COVID. And this visual, this network map, shows technology-based partnerships in education and emergencies in Lebanon as the red lines. And you can see the expansion during the pandemic when you compare the visual from 2019 to 2021. Within Lebanon, several respondents described to us how they really had to establish new relationships with businesses to support virtual platforms for out-of-school children. Now, in addition to a rise in private sector participation, respondents spoke more generally and conceptually about the growth and the entrenchment of business-like ways of working in the EIE space. So for example, respondents noted that the education and emergency sector has become increasingly competitive, where competition tends to characterize the sector rather than coordination, which is what they seek 
A respondent explained, everyone is very territorial of what they're doing. Everyone's competing for funding. Another said it's challenging for folks to share information when they have yet to secure funding to operate. So there's a lack of transparency there. As well, local EIE actors, which have secured funding from larger organizations, such as international organizations or international non-governmental organizations, described their work in country as increasingly more output driven, where quantitative data must be delivered on a strict schedule in order to maintain funding. A local partner described how one of their conditions was to have an external evaluator to accompany us. Another explained, you have to work in a very tight system. And international organization documents lend further evidence to the importance of innovation via this efficient output-based environment. For instance, Education Cannot Wait promotes their optimized and results-driven approach and seeks to incentivize partners to deliver results. Now, critiques of this marketized environment in EIE were expressed in interviews at both the global and the local levels, for instance, the participation of business actors was critiqued given the tensions involved in profit-oriented goals and mandates compared to humanitarian goals. We were told the reason is, of course, to get a profit, to return on whatever they do. Um, some other quotes include, at the end of the day, they want the market. A respondent described the sector as, quote, a tug of war. And another stated how efforts really easily crumble if there isn't the goodwill and trust among partners to coordinate, and that reflects this deeply competitive environment. And finally, the output-oriented projects, which require steady responsiveness to funders, counters the flexibility that's needed for participatory processes and practices. So a local NGO respondent said, they also focus a lot on numbers and targets because they have certain targets that they have to meet. So we're pressured to meet their targets. Now, the partnership that was described in this last quote in the bottom there, um, was it was between a large international organization and a local NGO, and it revealed how the local NGO had to abide by particular output-based practices, they had to deliver data on a particular timeline, and that the international organization didn't communicate with them in a transparent manner about their goals. So our analysis suggested, obviously, a clear imbalance in this partnership in which the international organization largely drove the mandates and the practices, and the local NGO had to respond to the international funders' needs. So a second overarching thing, theme from our findings centers on the two overlapping um, concepts of participation and localization. So despite widespread agreement that participation and localization of education and emergencies efforts would contribute to the success of partnerships, each level of our analysis exposed the limited nature of both uh, participation and localization. So global level interviews revealed widespread agreement that participation of country level actors or members of affected communities in global partnerships remains very low. When local participants do engage at the global level, they're often tokenized and their voices hold little power. We were told the beneficiaries are rarely in the room. And oftentimes, if they're in the room, it can take a very tokenistic, paternalistic lens. Some respondents explained that this lack of participation results in poor contextualization of activities. So one respondent said, sometimes I feel like they're dealing with Yemen as if they're dealing with Denmark. Sometimes they don't understand the context. And sometimes when they put in their strategy, they don't give the space for those of us who are living on the ground to plan or engage in the planning. And then another set of localization. I think the sector preaches about localization, but I haven't seen much action yet. Now, 
this is a network analysis of the partnerships in within Lebanon, um, and it displays the widespread participation of international actors, including international organizations, bilateral agencies, foundations, companies, all headquartered in the global north. And they're represented in this visual by dark dots, whereas those headquartered in Lebanon are in light dots. You can see the centrality of the uh, the organizations from the global north within the country. Now, several respondents mentioned that COVID might have actually um, accelerated localization. So border closures and lockdowns reduced the presence and the proximity of international actors. Like folks couldn't fly in and guide projects and fly back out. So as a result, local partners took the helm and maintained projects during an exceptionally challenging time. A respondent noted how this pandemic has emphasized the organic resilience that exists within communities and reminded us that we as international NGO workers, we have a limited view into what will work in a given context. The travel, the reasons for the travel, it was frivolous. So I think that will certainly cause a change in the sector. Some organizations have thought differently about their practices, that the pandemic was helping us to put into practice some of this decolonization ways of working, to listen to grantees rather than telling grantees what to do. <clears throat> However, some of the actors felt that, in fact, quite a few felt that structural inequities in the global humanitarian architecture would likely hinder localization from ever taking hold. We were told the bigger, bigger underlying causes of inequality and poverty and exploitation are not really addressed through this. And some national actors remarked that no change had taken place at all because of the scale and the centrality of international organizations already in the country. We were told, I did not really feel a change because, you know, we have so many international NGOs working. We have really big operations in terms of UN agencies. So international staff are really very present in the country. And with COVID and so on, this has not really changed much. In fact, it, it, I mean, it may have even increased. So our network analysis supports this. The international organizations actually did increase in number in Lebanon, as did their relationships between 2019 and 2021. Now, although country partners may have led the response during the crisis, the overall network structure doesn't suggest that there was an acceleration of localization, but instead really the durability of relationships. So a third key overarching theme from the vertical analysis, which really intersects with the other themes that I've already discussed, is that of power asymmetries within EIE partnerships and also um, how some partnerships manage to address these power imbalances and create more meaningful partnerships. So at the global level, power imbalances appear to be clear and longstanding as reflected in limited participation and localization, as I've already discussed, and how Northern actors and organizations really drive policy decisions, agenda setting, and determining of outcomes. So when we asked which organizations wield most influence in EIE partnerships, we were told repeatedly those with resources, namely donors. So donors, there are certain donors that are super influential and really throw their weight around. Whoever has money, I'd say primarily donors because money talks and people who hold the purse strings are able to influence. So despite widespread acknowledgement that the humanitarian sector needs to change to shift power imbalances, according to interview respondents, these inequities still persist. Now our network analysis further lent evidence to power asymmetries between organizations. The degree centrality measures show that international organizations hold central positions in the network with more ties than any other group. 
as highlighted by the yellow bar here. It's also important to recognize that if you look at the number of organizations, there are actually relatively few international organizations overall in the network. And this small number holds a disproportionately large number of connections. So for instance, by far, the single most central organization in both phases of our analysis was UNICEF. In contrast, local and national NGOs are more numerous. There's a lot of them, but they have fewer ties. So an organization's location in this network or its centrality may reflect more opportunities, stronger ties to more actors, the ability to determine flows of information or to distort flows of information. And, they, and therefore, centrality is often tied to influence and power. And we acknowledge that determining power based solely on centrality is quite suggestive, but based on our triangulation of all of our findings, we posit that the most central actors in this network hold the most influence. So we also analyze ties between the different types of organizations in the network. So this is a heat map of ties between organizations that shows that the most numerous ties in the network are between international NGOs and local and national NGOs, followed by ties between international NGOs themselves and then between international NGOs and private companies. <clears throat> so our network analysis, in conjunction with our qualitative findings, suggests that power is expressed not only through the wielding of financial resources, but also in how relationships are organized and structured and function through these partnerships, including who has the power to define and disseminate knowledge and standards and ways of working. So in reflecting on power dynamics, I wanted to share a quote from one respondent from a local NGO who stated, in the end, you're not equal. They plan and you execute and they can stop at any time. <clears throat> so the 2020 escalation in the Black Lives Matter movement and protests and growing calls to decolonize global development and humanitarianism led many organizations to acknowledge the need for change and to address these power imbalances. Many organizations released statements decrying racism in the sector. They signed pledges to initiate change. And we found this moment as really pivotal. We felt a narrative was changing in the sector and in global education more generally. So we wound up really what wound up happening was we conducted a separate, like a sub-study within our broader study on race and power and global education, where we began to ask questions about racial equity in our interviews. And we searched for mentions of race in the documents as well. And we also uh, analyzed separately 40 global organization websites. And we applied Charles Mills's concept of white ignorance to our analysis to help us understand how race has been taken up in the global education arena. So Mills describes white ignorance as the privilege to misunderstand, evade, or ignore issues of race. He also argued that this white ignorant, ignorance has to be considered global given that racist beliefs justified worldwide colonial expansion. So in our analysis, we uncovered what Mills calls racial erasure. Um, for instance, of over 200 documents that we analyzed, only two had any substantive discussion of race or racism. And we found that global education organizations talk about racism uh, through euphemisms that sanitize racial inequities. They don't very rarely use the word race or racism. And interview respondents expressed an inclination to silence discussions on race, deeming the subject politicized or controversial or taboo. 
So for example, we were told race is nowhere even on the agenda and that discussions of race are limited because organizations are wary of using terminology that might be offensive. Also, our research showed that within global education bodies, racism has been largely considered just a U.S. problem. Uh, many interview respondents stated that anti-racist activities, statements, policies were only relevant within the U.S. And this shows what Mills describes as denying white supremacy as a global system. A European respondent told us racial equity work is very American, very much focused on the Black American experience. And then finally, we found little evidence of policies or programs in global education to bring about structural change that might address racism. So of those 40 websites that we studied, over, over 20 of them released solidarity statements in the summer of 2020, but most did not follow up with concrete action. And those that did focused mainly on individual, like personal change, as opposed to structural change. Mills describes this surface level treatment of racism as a neglect of social structural factors. A respondent described uh, and said, I think it's a lot of surface stuff. And then another said more bluntly, I think this is all bullshit. So power imbalances, our third theme, manifested in various ways, most notably between actors in the global North and the global South and associated racial inequities, which of course must be understood through the lens of colonial legacies. But I'd also like to share with you some positive findings. Um, given that our research sought to examine promising partnership practices, we intentionally selected as case studies those that appeared from our initial survey to function in positive ways and with strong outcomes. So although the case studies involve different types of organizations doing all different kinds of activities, each prioritized participatory practices and local knowledges, exhibited similar practices, which I'll discuss in a second, and sustained the partnerships and their education programs through acute crises. So for example, all the local organizations in our case studies prioritized participation from local educational and refugee communities, including teachers and families. According to educators, they felt as though they were trusted collaborators on the projects and that international partners respected them. In turn, international actors voiced how much they learned from their local partners and that they trusted local actors, affording them the flexibility that they needed to make appropriate decisions based on the context through a very hands-off approach. So localization linked to trust, linked to communication and care, appeared to sustain partnerships through acute crises. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our findings brought to light also the vital work of local actors and how they embraced refugee community participation. So we posit that when partners valued mutual learning, including local knowledges and expertise, partnership activities were sustained through crisis and in turn supported student retention in school, in virtual school, and their attendance in classes. So an example of the knowledge that sustained learning were, were highlighted during the pandemic. The country level data exposed the resilience and the creativity of local stakeholders and refugees, especially teachers and students. The pivot to virtual learning while challenging and not without um, problems, it was done quickly and flexibly with kindness and with humor. And here are just some examples of our virtual observations. These are screenshots of lessons created and held via WhatsApp. In the last image, you can see that the students are laughing at a voice comment from the teacher. And from one of our observations, this is one of my favorites, on the last day of a science class, the teacher greeted the students and the students greeted the teacher back and one student said, Bye, mister, we're gonna miss you. Don't know how I'm gonna spend my summer without sciences. 
So a vertical analysis, yes, points to the potential for significant power asymmetries, in particular due to structures that promote inequitable participation in education and emergencies, activities, and decision-making. However, even in the face of these power imbalances, we see the potential for meaningful partnerships. So from analyzing all our data vertically, we arrived at five key ways in which partnerships in education and emergencies can support and sustain learning for refugees. We refer to these as guiding principles. Now, each of these five principles demands a shift. So this suggests a need for a more overarching transformation in traditional ways of operating in the sector. First, our study suggests a shift from saviorism to care. So more traditional or commonplace approaches to education and emergencies often derive from a place of benevolence or charity. And while these might be considered very positive attitudes, they risk embodying saviorism, where partners who perceive themselves to be in a more privileged position act as though the other partner requires rescuing. Now, these motivations focus more on those providing aid and in a very one-directional sense, rather than a focus on local partners as people who have struggles, but also agency and knowledge and ingenuity and capabilities. Second, we advocate for a shift from a, cultural, a culture of monitoring and outputs to a culture of trust and respect. So our findings suggest that partners ought to trust and respect one another and their values, their goals, even in the case that they differ. Trust and respect involves recognition that all partners hold strengths and capacities to conduct their work. When partners trust and respect one another, their partnerships can avoid an approach that emphasizes efficiency and dictates output-driven projects via a constant monitoring of data. So the third is a shift uh, from a focus on coordination to communication. So coordination is a widely agreed upon factor in effective EIE programming. It's touted as a means to achieving more efficient partnerships and successful outcomes. Yet in considering how partnerships work, participants were clear that ongoing and organic communication is key, much more so than someone trying to coordinate everyone. And fourth, a shift is needed from capacity building to mutual learning. So although this term capacity building has pervaded the humanitarian sector and, and the development sector, our findings suggest that this one directional and often paternalistic concept does not capture how effective partnerships operate. Partnerships that embrace mutual learning occur when those from the global north position themselves as learners too. And then finally, uh, shift we, we advocate for a shift from power imbalances to self-reflection through awareness and interrogation. So our vertical analysis at each level and through each set of data revealed that power imbalances pervade partnerships in EIE. Power dynamics reflect structural and direct forms of inequity, sometimes economic, often racialized and colonial. Our study suggests that some partnerships might never achieve true equality. In particular, when resources and funding come into play, inequities might just remain entrenched. But meaningful partnerships, which result in positive outcomes based on care and trust and respect and mutual learning, can be achieved when everyone involved moves towards self-reflection and, and awareness of structural power asymmetries. So thank you so much for listening and for joining me today, especially thank you to Dr. Gafar Kukar,
for inviting me and organizing this talk. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the study and access all the related publications and resources, which I believe are all open access, if they're not, you can just email me and I'll send them to you. Um, please visit the project website at eiepartnerships.org and I'll be really happy to take your questions and comments. Thank you so much, Dr. Manashi, Francine. We really appreciate that. Maybe we can give some emoji appreciation. Yeah.